Hello, everyone, and good day. Uh, after we finished speaking about the Renaissance, its drama, its poetry, and its prose, we moved to speak another, about another important era or age, if I can say that, in the history of England, the United Kingdom, in politics, society, but most importantly about the literature of this, of this era. We'll be speaking about an era expanding from the middle of the 17th century to the early 18th century. These are actually two things related very much to each other. The, the first one is called the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth. And the second part is called Restoration. Restoration from Restore. Nowadays, generally, Commonwealth refers to countries that were occupied, colonized by England. So any country that was occupied by England at one particular time is now part of the Commonwealth, like the, the Francophone countries, countries that were occupied by France. But the Commonwealth refers to a very important period in the history of England. And then it was followed soon after by, this is very short, probably 15 years or so, soon after it was restored, uh, uh, followed by something called restoration. What is the Commonwealth? What is the restoration? Let's see it together. So, uh, so far, we have spoken about uh, the Puritans, remember? Then the Renaissance age, the Renaissance. Yep, the, the Puritans as a religious group, they were also political group. They were becoming more and more powerful. They closed the theater, but more important than closing the theater, they killed the king because there was a, a huge political division in the English society between the Puritans and the Cavaliers. Now, the Puritans fought against the king because of the corruption, the vices, remember? Whatever they said about the drama, they said in a way or another about the political system, about, about the monarchy. And there was a huge war, something uh, that we refer to generally as civil war. You know what civil war? When two... Uh, groups in the same society, same country fight, Harb Ahliya, yani. Seville, war, there was a lot of blood, a lot of death, and a lot of massacres, uh, so to speak. When the Puritans were victorious, when they managed to win the civil war, what did they do the first thing? They executed the king. And this is England. Again, this is, remember we said the king was the most important person, God's representative on earth. He was the most powerful person. He was holy, sacred. The English people lived with the king, with the monarchy for over 1,000, probably 1,500 years. Everyone knows that the king is crucial. Yeah, the king could be corrupt, could be bad, the king or the queen, but the king was seen as crucial, vital, important to the stability of the society and the benefit of the, the interest of the individual. And now, what we saw in literature, and this is very interesting, how literature prepares our minds to certain events, how literature creates life, creates, changes life in a particular way. We've seen the king die before, yeah. but not in real life. In Shakespeare, another place, in Hamlet, in Macbeth, for one reason or another, in King Lear, the king dies. And even the death of the king in the literary works turned life upside down, like in Macbeth. The whole, everything was turned upside down. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. But here, for the first time, the king is executed. We'll speak in, in a bit about what happened next. But this era, this period that saw the king executed, killed, and had someone called Oliver Cromwell, a very important name. It's called the Commonwealth. It's called the Commonwealth. The monarchy was removed. No more king, no more queen, no more royal family in, in so many ways. And they wanted the parliament to, to rule with election, with democracy, more democratic uh, processes here. 
Now, Cromwell was a very powerful man. He's the leader of the Commonwealth. He came soon after the king was executed, and he had so many important things to do to create the Commonwealth, the, the countries that now that formed the, the United Kingdom, mainly Scotland and Ireland. So he was a man of war because he fought battles, and he was also a man of peace because he wanted to negotiate and involve in dialogue between different uh, countries around, around him. However, again, this is imp history is important here, how literature influences life and history and how history also influences in a way or another uh, literature. But we don't want to speak a lot about history, but th really, this is interesting to read. Now, when this man died about 10 years later, sometimes it's so sad that some important people die very quickly. And people who are really horrible, they just live forever, forever sometimes, yeah. When he dies, what happened? He was succeeded by? What does it mean? So, when he's, if he's followed by his son, what does this mean? Does this rem Exactly, this is like having the king again. What's, what's wrong with the king, other than the corruption and everything? Is that someone, because he was born to a particular family, is more important than us, can rule us, can control us in a way or another. So when, Mar when sorry, this, this uh, Oliver Cromwell became the, 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 the protector of England, he earned this because he is a strong man, a diplomatic, and a smart politician. But if his son takes it, succeeds him, what does it mean? But again, in many ways, this is the English mentality because they love to have a king. They love to be ruled by a particular family because they have been trained all their lives throughout hundreds and hundreds of years that the king is crucial to the stability. Even today, the, the queen, Queen Elizabeth II, she isn't a strong ruler. She can't determine the, how, you know, politics and many things in England, but she's a symbolic ruler, and many people love her. Despite the fact that she spends, the, fa the royal family, spend a lot of millions and millions of money. Tax, tax money, but still many people feel it's necessary to have a royal family. Now, when his son followed him, succeeded him, his son was not as strong as Cromwell himself. Again, Oliver Cromwell, the leader of the Commonwealth. He was succeeded by his son, but his son was not strong enough. And in a way, in a way, this meant something to the people there. Because during this like, uh, period of 15 years or so or less, the English people generally were like, like, you know, when you want to do something, but you can't do it because you want to try something new, and then finally you just say, okay, enough. So they came to his son, and they said, sorry, we want the king back. And this is how much the English people love the, not, I can't generalize, of course, especially the high class, because many people had, like, benefited a lot from having a king or, or a queen, and the Commonwealth ended by bringing another king. King, remember, King J, uh, Charles I was executed, and they came, they invited, they brought King Charles II from France. This is called the restoration. What is the restoration? When the king was restored. That's it. Commonwealth, when the king was executed, and Oliver Cromwell ruled England in a way or another. So in 1660, we have what is called the restoration. The monarchy was restored again, and the man, King uh, Charles II, was brought from, from France. Because, you know, remember, they were kicked out in a way or another. Now, Again, it shows how significant the, the monarchy is for the English people. But something remained uh, uh, that couldn't change in a way or another. The, the, the monarchy itself and its powers and privileges were declining, were diminishing, were 
reduced because the parliament and politicians and people who were elected by people become more and more powerful. So yes, the king was restored, but the powers, the privileges, the authority, they were never the same. Until this very day, we have a very symbolic monarchy. The queen sometimes signs particular papers, approves particular uh, you know, cabinets by, by particular uh, uh, political parties like the Labour Party and the Tories. So politics is very important in this age. But here we're not only talking, remember in the past we were sp speaking about nationalism, the strong sense of the English identity, Queen England being the savior and the protector, and uh, about, you know, sweet Thames run softly till I end my song. The English people were all proud of everything English. But now this change from nationalism, loving your country as a whole, to political division. So. Some people supported this political party and others supported this political party. And this creates what we call political division. And this is politics more than nationalism. Okay, so nationalism is loving everything about your country, supporting, believing in your country. But being political generally here in this sense means that you support one political party over the others because of something. Now, something very funny happened later on. King James II, remember we had King James I in 1603, the man who translated the Bible, the authorized version of the Bible, the man who loved theater and literature, who had the masks in his own palace, remember? Now, King James II did something that could be considered stupid. He converted to Catholicism. <coughs> he, remember England is a Protestant country now because of King Henry VIII, when he had this dispute with the Pope, and he destroyed many monasteries and churches, and he executed so many Catholic people. Because England became changed, it's religion. It's still Christians, but they're not Catholic, they are Protestants. Now all of a sudden, this king, King James II, converts to Catholicism. Okay, remember, so many people were not happy with King Charles I. What happened? Fighting, political division, civil war, death, blood. But now, and this is really interesting, the English people seem to have learned from their own experience. They have learned that, okay, we kill the king, we fight, we kill each other, and then later on we bring the king again. So they learned something that nobody in Europe learned this quickly. In France, so many kings were executed and revolutions after revolutions. In, in Spain, the civil, war, the civil war ended like 60 years ago in Spain. And even today, there are still some you know, trouble, troubles and problems here and, and there. But the English learned this lesson very quickly in many ways. So when this king converted to Catholicism, what did they do to him? Did they kill him? Did they rebel against him? Did they fight him? Did they shed any blood? No. Again, they came to him and said, sorry, this is a Protestant country. You need to go. And they removed the king without shedding any drop of blood. And that's why this is called the bloodless revolution. You know bloodless revolution? The revolution that doesn't shed blood, no blood. Pure, clean revolution. It's called sometimes the glorious revolution. Thawr al-Majida in in, in Arabic. So, a lot of politics here. I'll speak about two important things later on. Number one, the middle class, and number two, literature and politics. So, what we care about here as literature students, it's good to know this brief history, is the rise of the middle class from now on, we'll speak about the, ri the rise of the middle class in every age, every era. And then politics and literature, and literature and, and politics. But what did the English people learn from this? They learned many things. Number one, that stability is important. Stability is crucial. You know stability? You don't want to change the situation. You can improve it. And if you want to change it, you change it without shedding any, any blood. By diplomacy, by 
by politics. So people wanted to avoid another revolution, especially a revolution that sheds the blood of the English people. Not easy to do, by the way. And that's why this is very interesting uh, history. OK? So people were more rational. We, later on, we'll speak about the age of reason in, in, in 50 years to come. People were, in, in the Renaissance, people were more about exploring. You know, the geographical discoveries. They wanted to break the barriers. They wanted to go beyond the limits. They wanted to change life. But now, because of the bloodshed and the fighting and the battles, they said, OK, wait. I think we need to wait a minute and think more carefully about what we do, where we go. So the sense of exploration and exper experimentation, in a way, was replaced by a sense of reason and stability. And this is very smart because the political system created something, an image that made people believe the stability of the country, if you have a stable, and even today, you know, Theresa May, the Prime Minister of England, she speaks about strong and stable, strong and stable. They're making fun of her statement, that the catchphrase she always uses, strong and stable. We want a strong and stable country. It started from here. They said, a strong country is a stable country. And a stable country, government, means more benefits to the individual. So if you, as an individual, if you want to achieve your own growth, material growth, if you want to get wealthy and rich, what do you do? You work hard to achieve the stability for all the society, the community. That's why there's something I usually like to say here. The political, the individual became political, and the political became individual. What is good for, for the community is good for, for me, the individual. We'll see how this is reflected on, on, uh, on literature. So we have more growth in science, in commercial growth, in trade, in geographical discoveries, in uh, British imperialism, in colonialism, British empire, everywhere. Many excellent things happened. And we speak about the English, the, the, the union of parliaments of England and Scotland. Now, before I move to speak about literature, Look at this sentence. In the book, it says there was a union. There was a unity between England and Scotland, the parliament. But Ireland remains the problem. This is what the book says. Exactly, it says Ireland was still the problem. Ireland was still a problem. What do you think? And that's why here I use an exclamation mark. I'm not stating this as a fact. Ireland remained a problem to the United Kingdom. Why is, why is Ireland depicted here as a problem? You know Ireland? We have Ireland, we have Scotland, we have Wales, we have England. The United Kingdom, in addition to other things. Please. Yeah, thank you. There is Catholicism here. Not many people were forced to convert to, to be, uh, becoming Protestant. So Catholic people. So what does it mean also? Is it like washing? Uh-huh. How, how, how do you mean? Can you explain? Okay. Okay, that's very really interesting. Thank you. There is also whitewashing here. England was the problem, not Ireland. It's exactly like now Israel says Gaza is the problem. No, the occupation is the problem. So the book here presents it as if Ireland is the problem, is causing trouble for for England while England is occupying and colonizing Ireland and parts of Ireland and killing people, yes, shedding the blood of the, the Irish people. Until this very day, there's still this trouble between Ireland and parts of Ireland and, and England. So interesting how the book presents this. And I told you before, be careful. When you read any book, especially by books written by 
by white Europeans who believe in uh, colonialism and imperialism. So this is not only against Asia and Africa and Carib the Caribbean, but also against parts of Europe like, like in, in Ireland. So thank you very much for saying this. This is called whitewashing. Again, what is whitewashing? Whitewashing when a movie, a book, someone tries to hide the problems, the trouble, the vices, the crimes, and present things as if nothing bad is going on. Like watch a movie, someone comes here to, uh, for example, to Gaza and, and makes a movie or writes a book about Gaza. And you read the whole book, you watch the whole movie, and there are no references to the Israeli occupation, to the siege, to five, six decades of occupation, of oppression. If, if nobody is referring to Israel here, this is called whitewashing. Whitewashing Israel, you know the word white and wash? To wash somebody so there is nothing wrong with them. If someone makes a movie about Israel, as and describes Israel, how Israel is, you know, the only democracy in the Middle East, or the only democracy, democracy in the universe, or how Israel is a very significant research having technology, cancer research, without referring to the fact that there is a lot of racism against non-Jews, against black people, people of color. In Israel, the seven decades of occupation of colonialism, this is whitewashing. So the book doesn't, remember we, we spoke about this also when he, when the writer here, two writers actually, when they depicted colonialism as glory. It's not glory because it caused the deaths of millions and millions of, of people. So yeah, thank you. This is called uh, whitewashing. Okay, now I'll move to speak about two poets of this era. The first one, we go back to Andrew Marvel. Remember Andrew Marvel? He's a romantic poet. Yes. But he was also he was also a politician, a member of the parliament. And he wrote poetry supporting who? Cromwell. This is his famous poem, praising and celebrating Cromwell. It's called an oration. There could be an an here. If there is an an, it means the H is silent. An oration, ode or the poem, upon Cromwell's return from Ireland. Long title, okay? You can mem only memorize this. Upon Cromwell's return. Who's the poet? <coughs> Marlowe. What's going on? So again, remember what poetry we had in the past? About society, love poetry. Religion. Remember the religion? Are we going to see new concerns, new interests, new themes, new issues here? Someone read, please. Yeah. So restless Cromwell could not cease. And the, the could not cease. Cease. And the glorious arts of peace, but throw a dangerous war, urge him after start. What filled the of all the, the, the civil war, war, war where, where, where his were not the deepest scar? Scar? In the book, I, th I think it says in the book, Wars and Stars. Wars and Scars, sorry. Okay. So, interesting. One more. Cromwell. In glorious art of peace. Urged his active star. Where his were not the deepest scar. What is the poet saying? What's going on? Yeah. He's not a king. He, he was the ruler. I, I would say something like prime minister, but he wasn't a king. But more or less, he was like a king because he was succeeded by his son when he died. So, but as a ruler here, let's call him ruler, protector of England. Who's talking? 
Okay, the poet is Marvel. The speaker could be Marvel. The difference between the poet, the author, and the speaker. So here, seemingly, it sounds like Marvel, Andrew Marvel is praising Cromwell. and celebrating Cromwell as a hero, a hero of both and, and peace. So he's praising his, he's restless. He doesn't dress. He works very hard. He doesn't sleep. We have this. In Arabic poetry, we have this all the time. We have poets praising the rulers, the governors, the emirs, the caliphs, all the time. He doesn't cease in the inglorious art of peace. So during peace, he talks. He you know, engages in dialogue, politics, diplomacy. But in war, his star shines the most. So he is part of the you know, peace, diplomacy, negotiations, but also when there are battles and fighting and wars and civil wars, what does he do? He, he also fights. So he's a strong ruler, a ruler who can balance between diplomacy and, and war. In many ways, this is a political poem. Because who's being praised? What is the subject matter? A love poem? God? Cromwell. Who's Cromwell? He's the ruler of England. So when you write a poem for your president, the prime minister, this is politics. And during this era, politics became a huge part of literature. Political themes. Political, political themes. And that's why, again, Marvel, don't forget, Marvel was supporting the commonwealth against the king. Later on, he became a politician and became a member of the parliament. He was celebrated as the unofficial poet laureate. He was the prince of poets, but wasn't that official because he wrote several poems praising Cromwell and his life and his achievements and, and his struggle. Okay? This reminds me of Al-Mutanabbi. Remember Al-Mutanabbi? Yeah. The, the greatest Arabic uh, uh, poet of all time, most of his poetry is like this, celebrates a particular person. And it's really beautiful how there are similarities, but at the same time, there are dissimilarities. Many people would read this and say, hmm, I don't think this is poetry, because poetry is about right, emotions, feelings. We don't have much, even the imagery here, the metaphors, we don't have much <coughs> of that, right? But still, this is the poetry of that time. Poetry started to change in themes in many ways. Al Mutanabi, this reminds me of something and probably I quoted before. Mutanabi was praising Saif al Dawla and saying how courageous he is. He has, so, so, to describe someone as courageous, you speak about urged his active star. His star shines, rises. He fights. He doesn't care. He doesn't fear. Mutanabi says, uh, praising uh, Saif al Dawla, وَقَفْتَ وَمَا فِي الْمَوْتِ شَكٌ لِوَاقِفِي كأنك في جفن الردى وهو نائم وقفت وفا وما في الموت شك لواقف meaning you were in a position where anyone standing would die but you because you're courageous you you don't care you stand defying look at this simile كأنك في جفن الردى وهو نائم there is a personification of death here where death is like a sleeping person and where is he sleep standing Exactly here, on the eyelashes, on the eyelid of death. You're standing here. So when death wakes up, the first thing he claims is you. But you don't care because you are powerful. This is always beautiful. He's not, he doesn't. He's saying, like, your enemies are heroes. Is he praising them? No, he's praising Saif al-Dawla because he only fights heroes. And while he's doing this during the war and the fighting, because in war, we're all worried and, you know, sweating and terrified and terrorized and we're fighting and etc. But because you are a fearless leader during war, like this. 
Beautiful. Is this similar to this? Which is more beautiful? Arabic. Arabic? Oh, good. Hey, think of when probably when you finish doing a BA in English literature, you could do a comparison. You study comparative literature between Al Mutanabi and uh, Andrew Marvin. Okay? Now, another text, remember Lovelace? Yeah. Do you remember him? Yeah. What did he say before? One mark if you, were, if you memorize his poetry. Don't look, don't look. Lovelace. One mark if you know his, very famous, very easy to memorize. Stone walls don't a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. I asked you to translate it into Arabic. You don't have to memorize this for the course, the exam, but it's really good to know. Makes you, you know, confident and proud of yourself. Like, oh, I know Arabic, uh, English poetry as well. So in this poem, it's called to uh, Locasta. Remember the first one to Alfia. Yeah. So this is either an imaginary woman he loves, or it's his woman that he calls by different names. He uses attractive names. Going to. The wars, again, a political poem. Going to the wars, fighting. Here where the public, the personal, the individual is public. It's a really very interesting poem, but we're going to study only one extract here. Someone read, please. Very good. Someone else? Please. Unkind. Unkind, unkind. unkind. Thy, thy means your, in all the English. Yes? Chaste breast and quiet mind. To war and arms I fly. What is he saying? What do you understand from this? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. No, English, of course. He's brave. He's brave. From war. Okay, cool. But who's he talking to? His beloved. What is he saying to her? No, she's don't go he sweet should be between, you know, inverted commas. But we can probably explain why there are brackets here. Because officially, remember, this coin is comma, lady comma. But here, brackets, he's like, it's like as if he's in, putting hair in prison. Like tying, chaining, chaining hair. Don't come after me. Don't run away, I'm going to come back, I don't know. He's controlling hair by putting his beloved, the woman he loves, his mistress in brackets. So now, can, he, can she run away? She can't because there are walls against her, in a way. Her, don't tell me I'm unkind because he's leaving her. He's leaving her behind. Remember for Shakespeare, the woman, for Marlowe, the woman was the most important thing. The love poetry, the Elizabethan age. But now here we have something more important than the woman. It's the love of your country. And that's, again, how the individual becomes public. He's telling here in the rest of the poem that I can't love you if I, don't, if I don't love my country more, if I don't defend my country, if I don't go to fight to protect my country. And this is political. This is the uh, restoration, the uh, commonwealth. Tell me not, sweet, I am unkind. Don't accuse me of being unkind and cruel. From that, from that, from the nunnery of thy chaste breast and quiet mind. I like how he describes her physical appearance and describes her her quiet mind. It's good. It's an upgrade. In the past, remember the woman was absent. Shall I compare thee to summer's day? Uh, come live with me and be my love. But here the woman is using you're unkind and there is her mind is praised. Some people might say no because he still tells her your mind is quiet. So it's good for a woman to have a quiet mind. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it's an upgrade from the previous age, where the woman's mind 
has a place in the poem. Later on, we'll have more and more presence, more and more strong roles by, by women. So, to war, arms could be a pun here. Because arms, one arm, two arms, or arms, but weapons. Arms means weapons, asliha. But arms also means the hands. So he's playing on this word. Is he going to war? Is he walking to war? Is he crawling to war? Is he running to war? No. He's flying to war. He doesn't walk. He flies to war because he goes willingly to defend his country, to fight for the thing he loves the most. It's his country. And that's different poetry from the one we studied before. So what's going on here again? The poet here is showing us how the, the individual, his love to his wife, is more important, uh, uh, can, is less important than his love to his country. Because defending the country means safety, stability, security to you, to your wife, to all individuals in the society. This is a political poem in which the country is more important than the woman you love. This is called political poetry. Loveless to Locasta going to the wars. Please. He's addressing her. She is sweet. So sweet, like when in the other poem in uh, Marvel also, he said, had we but world enough and time, this coyness, comma, lady, comma. So this is when you call for somebody in English, you use a comma. But here he doesn't use a comma, he uses brackets. In my opinion, this is him trying to control her, to tell her, stay at home, wait for me here, don't go out, don't leave me, I'll be back. Because he repeats it here, in the, in the rest of the poem, he also says, dear, also in brackets. So don't run away, I'm coming back. Okay? So, tell me not sweet. Oh, my sweet is sitting here. My sweet wife, don't tell me I am unkind because I'm leaving you, because I'm fighting for some one I love more, the country, and the safety of the country is your own safety. Very beautiful poem, you can Google it and read more about it. So, and the rhyme scheme is? A. A. B. Thank you for saying A, B, A, B very quickly because this is imperfect rhyme. Nunnery and fly, they rhyme, but not perfectly. Okay? Remember, there could be something. Is he afraid? Is he really, seriously flying to war? Because the rhyme doesn't help, doesn't flow, doesn't fly. Could be, yeah. Final text today, we'll stop here. We'll go back to Andrew Marvel. This is another poem from the Restoration Age. So again, we have the Commonwealth, politics, politics, politics. The Restoration, also politics, politics. It doesn't mean everything about literature was politics. It means politics became a crucial part in, in literature. <laughs> Later in his life, when, uh, when Andrew Marvel grew very old, and he was tired of politics, and the city, and London, and the corruption, and the civil war, and the fighting, and prisons, and threats, and diplomacy, he went to the countryside and wrote several poems. One of them really lovely poem called The Garden. In many ways, this is a romantic poem. We'll speak about romantic literature. In which, in this poem, he contrasts life in the city and life in the countryside, in the village. What is he saying? Fair quiet. Have I found thee here? An innocence, thy sister dear. Mistaken long, I sought you then in the city. 
in busy companies of men. Society, the city, London, society is all but rude to this delicious solitude. You know what delicious is? Yeah. Yummy. When you describe food, you say, so maybe if I took out this word and I asked you to complete, you're going to say, this delicious pizza, this delicious cheesecake, this delicious ice cream. But this is some kind of, you know, personifying something or changing. There's a metaphor here. You know solitude from solo. You know solo? Solo means alone. Sololoquy. Solitude, solitude means loneliness. But it's loneliness that you choose to be alone because you want to be far away from corruption in the city. So again, he's personifying quiet. Quiet, peace. راحت البال يعني الهداوة. Have I found, finally, I found you here. Where? In the garden. Where? In the village. Where? In the city. And you, and innocence, another personification, thy sister. So innocence is the sister of? Of quiet. They are sisters. They're not human beings, but it's like their company. This is the company he likes, not the company of politicians in the city. Mistaken long, I sought you then. I thought that I would find innocence and quiet in the city, in the busy companies of men. But I was mistaken. I was, this is someone confessing his mistake, not like the king when he said, for you have but mistook me, right? Society here is city. Why doesn't he use city? Two things. Number one, society is four syllables. So it works for the the music, the rhythm, the foot here, yeah, the feet. City, two syllables. But also, he doesn't mean the city as a place, the as it is. Thank you very much. The people in the city, the society, the community there, is all but rude. And there is another personification. Rude is a word to describe people. The life itself is rude in the city. In the village, it's peace, it's quiet, it's innocence. To this delicious solitude. So this delicious solitude in the village. So what's going on here? We have a poet who's running away from the city. A poet who's escaping politics and corruption. He's seeking peace, solitude, innocence, and quiet. Where? Not in the city because of the politicians and politics and corruption, but in the country side. These are three examples from the poetry of this age. And we summarize everything here. This is a long slide. Don't write down. You'll find this online. So politics, political side of literature became very important during the Commonwealth and restoration. restoration. We have this Lovelace going to war. And Marvel's poems celebrate Cromwell as a hero. And then there is this thing about government and political parties. Marvel also became the unofficial poet laureate during Commonwealth because he praised him most of the time. He also, in another poem in the garden, he contrasts life, politics in the city, and the countryside, the countryside where there is peace and quiet. The restoration gave more importance to the stable values. What's the stable values? What's the stability? Stiqrar. It's like, let's not do another revolution. Let's not fight. Let's be stable and work for the stability of the country. Now, when Cromwell died and his son was removed, Mar Marvel was in danger. He was almost arrested and imprisoned because of the political, because of, he supported Cromwell, but he wasn't because he was a politician, a member of the parliament, and he became a member of of the parliament. We'll speak about another poet next class, John Milton, one of the most significant English poets of all times. He usually comes uh, to mind when people speak Chaucer and then Milton. Milton was put in prison because he also supported Cromwell. The only person who saved his life is his friend Andrew Marvel. So poetry, politics, politics, poetry, they were connected in so many in so many ways during this age and this will change forever the way poetry and literature 
is written and introduced to us. I'll stop here. Do you have a question? Feel free to ask. Okay, thank you very much. And next class, we have a review session for the midterm exam. Please prepare and uh, if you have questions, again, bring them along and see you soon. I'll take a